The Ready to Learn Learning Triangle is a teaching tool. It addresses various learning styles and engages different senses. This workshop is based on these principles, view, read, and do. Have any of you ever wanted to buy something from TV to help your children learn to read or make them maybe a little bit smarter? Or have any of you ever thought, oh, I want my child to read at two years old? And so you've seen a program that you've thought, okay, I'm going to buy that to help my children. Liz, you're nodding your head, yes. Why would you want that? Why do you want to buy something to help your child learn to read? What, it, what entices you maybe? Well, I think partially because the infomercial that I watch for the specific DVD series um, showed them or keeping themselves entertained. Oh, okay. And so, I, and I thought, well, if they're reading, that must mean they're smarter. And I, th you know, and I okay. think that there's a lot linked to it as far as okay. All right. how it's perceived. Nancy, you're a grandma. As a grandma, do you want your kids, your grandkids to excel and do well? And have you ever been influenced to maybe buy a particular program that will help them bet more? Um. Not really. I don't watch infomercials. Okay, so, <laughs> so you're good. Because I, just, I just read to them. <laughs> you just read to them. Well, I have in this box, in this box, the answer to helping your children learn to read. Now, we're not talking about a two-year-old reading. We're talking about a child, the things that you can do to help prepare them so when they go to school, they're going to be prepared to read. And most of these, not most of these, all of them are free. And in any, um, no matter what you buy, you're going to be investing not only some money, but the most important thing that we can invest for our children, no matter what it is, is time. Time is the most important thing that you can invest to help your child learn to read. Now, how many of you have heard that you need to read 20 minutes a day to your children? Okay. Erica, how old is your child right now? He's five and a half months. Okay. And does he sit still for 20 minutes at a time? No. No. So that does not work. Those of you that have children under 18 months, under a year old, your singing, your nursery rhymes, and your finger plays count as literacy experiences. Now, once again, Erica, are you singing songs more than 20 minutes a day to your child? Probably not more than 20, 20 minutes, minutes, but, but a yeah. lot of it. Lot and of so as you think of that, that is the very first thing that I have in my box is a little cassette tape that you need to use a lot of music and a lot of singing and nursery rhymes. Remember, we've talked about that when children hear language, that they'll be able to speak it and then say and then read. Remember, listening comprehension precedes reading comprehension. It's a very important part of that singing. So don't worry about always reading 20 minutes when your children are younger, but singing to them during nursery rhymes, finger plays, nursery rhymes, are their literacy experience. Now, as they get a little bit older, even um, not much older, is that you want to provide books for them. Um, a lot of experts, one of my favorite authors' name is Jim Trelease, and he writes a series of books as the Read Out Loud Handbook. And he says that you should have books in every room of your house, and even for your babies. Now, those of you that have been around babies a lot, Nancy, if I handed this to an eight-month-old, what would they do with it? Chew on it. Chew on it. Okay. <laughs> and so we would encourage you to get some um, board books for babies, but have books in your home and have them all over and show a lot of different, um, different kinds of books that they can have. The next thing I have to represent is some chapsticks for lips. And this is just to remind you to talk and talk and talk and talk to your child. The more you talk to your child, the more words they learn, the more they interact. Talking is one of the most important things that you can do to help prepare your child to read. Isn't that interesting? Is just talking to them, singing to them, having books available. The last thing, which is a little bit um, something that you might not understand, so I hope that I can explain this, and we only have one male here, but we do know that research has shown over and over again when there's a strong male influence that reads to children, they want to read. Now, I've often wondered as I've read those studies myself, why? Why? 
why if a woman reads, why does it not have as big an impact as when a male reads? I don't know why, I can't give you that answer, but every research shows that if a child sees their father read or another positive inf male influence in their lives, then they're going to be like, more likely to read. And so I'm really glad that you're here today with us, and I'm glad that you feel it's important because it is important for a male to read. Those of you that have husbands, Encourage your husbands to read. Does it always have to be a storybook? No, they can read the newspaper. They can read different things, or they can just even tell stories to them. Magazines, when they see, a child sees a, a father reading or a positive male influence, then they're more apt to read too. All of these, once again, are very, very simple. None of them really cost anything, but they do cost our time and that is very valuable that you need to take that time to read to your children today as we go through this workshop the name of this workshop is called shared reading shared reading um liz what does sharing mean uh taking something and sh letting someone else use it either with you or Okay, or giving them, or giving the, them opportunity. the opportunity to. And that's what we're going to talk about is what shared reading is. Um, we're going to look at a clip, and I want to read this quote. It's from Mem Fox. She's a very famous children's author, but she also talks, writes a lot of books for parents to how to help their children. And as we um, look at this clip, I want you to think of the shared when you are doing something together. The fire of literacy is created by an emotional spark between a child, a book, and the person reading it. It is not achieved by the book alone or the adult who's reading it out loud. It's a relationship winding between all three bringing them together in harmony. Isn't that interesting? So when we talk about shared reading, it's the person reading it, it's the book, and it's the child. <laughs> How many of you have ever read a book to get it over with? <laughs> and then it's all about not really the book, not the child. It's, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to mark it off for the teacher, or I know I'm supposed to do this. That's not what we're talking about here with shared reading. We're going to talk about how there's different ways to read and different books to use with different ages and stages in this workshop. And I want you to think of the children that you work with, the children in your home, and make sure that you think, where are they and how can I do that? What are some ways that you can help your children enjoy to read? Well, I'm just going to give you some simple activities, some simple ideas. Now, in most of the workshops, we do what we call the um, learning triangle, where we review a program, we review it with a book, and we do an activity. We do know that if a child has a library card, they read more. Library cards are free, and there's not just books at a library. There's music, there's storytelling, there's ideas that you can do. One of my favorite things about going to the library is for my child to actually talk to the librarian. And it's fun to watch them interact and have a relationship of wanting to go to the library. And so a library, it's interesting. It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't really be hard to understand this, but Children read 40% more if they have a library card. And so I encourage you, if you don't have a library card, to go get one. Use the library. Make it someplace your children is familiar with and the people there, they know. Um, there was some research done about what shared reading is and how effective it is. And there's just three simple ideas that you can use to do shared reading. And I'm going to share those with you right now. They're very, in fact, most of you are going to go, I already do that when we talk about it. But I'm going to tell you some evidence from doing this, why it's very critical. The first one we're going to do, as I'm going to find it, is called simplification. Now, simplification is when you take a magazine at the doctor's office or someplace that you're with your child, and instead of reading the magazine, you start pointing out, oh, look at her nose, or look at there's the green grass. And you actually don't even use the book 
as it's written, but you simplify it to almost entertain your child. But that's actually reading. Uh, the next step is engagement, where the child will make some comment, or will the child will ask a question, or there's some type of exchange going on. Remember, with engagement, there's an exchange. And then the next moment would, would be enhancement. In fact, if we were reading a magazine in the doctor's office and I said, um, look at the green grass. And then I would say to my child, oh, do you see green anywhere? There's the engagement. And then the enhancement would be where that child would maybe look at Kasia and say, oh, look at her pretty green shirt. See how simple that is? A lot of you probably read this way already, don't you? I'm just going to say that you can go home and give yourselves a big pat on the back because children that were read to like this from the very start, right from the start of reading, six months old, the children that were read to like this, instead of just taking a book, reading the words, and that's what we call reading verbatim, and believe me, as a mother, I've sometimes read verbatim where I'm just reading the pages. But when you do that, for the children, the group of children that they use those three simple concepts with compared to the group where they just were read to, their language development um, was nine months ahead of the child that was just read to. And it continued over the child's life, that their vocabulary, their comprehension, their phonetic awareness was more advanced. Now, having said that, my question is, what about the child that's not even read to? Wow. So as teachers and in our education department, in our education, we have a lot of groups of children that are going in. Once again, I've, no I've mentioned this in other workshops. I want to reinforce it here. If you have a child with a reading disability or any other kind of learning disability, you need to make some extra efforts. I know I have a daughter that does have a reading disability. We did the these things, but we were able to pick it up very quickly and notice it right away because we were aware of where she should have been and where she was not. Does that make sense? But these still can be very good, helpful ideas, even with children with reading disabilities. But when you do notice those, don't think that you can always correct them on your own. Sometimes you can, but for the most part, you're going to have to take some intervention. So let's talk about simplification, enhancement, engagement. What is that? And where do you start with a very young child? I have had more parents ask me this question. What do I do when my child wants to read the same book or have me read the same book to him over and over and over again? I say, do it. Do it. Do you guys have a favorite CD that you listen to over and over and over again? Kids like almost that security of knowing what's going to happen. And most of the time, if you ever dared try to skip a page, what happens? Okay, what happens? They make you go back. <laughs> they make you, uh uh, that's not right. And they make you go back. It's a familiar object to them. It's something that bonds you to them. Now, a suggestion that I have, and I'm not saying to that they can't read that book over and over again, but with my own kids, I would say, okay, you can pick one out, and then I can. Now, and so then maybe just introducing them to a couple more, but don't be afraid to do that over and over and over again. That's for a very young child. And as they grow older, another thing you can do with the simplification, engagement, and enhancement is to do some things that kid, what kids like. Now, one of my favorite books is called Chrysanthemum by Kevin Hinkies. And so I tried to read that to my, uh, my um, children at a very young age. It's a longer book. They didn't have the attention span. And so they didn't like it. But I, what I noticed about my little girl she would look at the first um, three pages and on that page was a picture of chrysanthemum a little mouse and it was when she was born and then there was eight sequential pictures of chrysanthemum as she grew and grew and grew and one day as I was watching my daughter look at that a thought occurred to me of the simplification engagement and enhancement and I thought how could I do that with this book because 
you know, she didn't even really like to look at the pictures, only that particular page. Well, what I found was my daughter liked looking at those baby pictures. So I got an idea and I took some of the verbiage from that book and I actually created a book using that with my daughter and her pictures. On the day she was born was the happiest day of her parents' lives, along with the day that Greg, Holly, Josh, Joy, Rob, Brett, Lily, and Spencer was born. She's perfect, said her mother, absolutely, said her father, and she was perfect. This is another thing that what we did was we simplified a book, we enhanced it, and I engaged my child because these are pictures of herself. Now, over the years, she's almost 11 now, is we have very a few volumes of this book because she did grow and grow and grow, and when she was old enough to appreciate it, she loved her name. And so that's why you have a photo album in front of you. Take what your kids love. Take a book that they love. Make them the main character of it or you can just make an ABC book or things that they like I have seen some incredible ideas come from my parents or not my parents but parents that I've been able to interact with where they've made a book about their friends or they've made a book about their relatives because that's very simple but you're engaging and then you're enhancing what your child is doing I've even been to a conference um, where the particular speaker said, if your child is having a hard time accomplishing a task, then write a story and take pictures of him doing it, doing it well, and then when he has a hard time, maybe read that book or remind him that he could do that. And they did this for a lot with children with some disabilities to help them see the steps that they would need to take to accomplish a certain activity. Very simple. Was it engaging? Yes, because the child was right inside of that um, activity. And you've enhanced something that's just very simple. Now, I have a book that I want to share with you. Um, um, it's called, Have You Seen My Duckling? This kind of book, and there's several out there, takes those three processes or those three ideas and they actually incorporate it in the book. A funny story about this book is one night I was actually out teaching a workshop and I came home and my husband had been reading to my daughter and he said to this book, he said, this isn't a very good book, why is it an award winning book? And I said, well that means it was awarded because of its pictures. <laughs> So the pictures are very good, but I'll show you. I said, well, what do you mean it's not a good book? And he said, well, look at it. All it says is, have you seen my duckling? 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 <laughs> then there's nothing on this page. This is done. I said, uh, come here. Let me read you the book. So this is how I read it for him. Remember, simplification, very simple book. It's already there. Engagement and enhancement. Okay, those in the front are going to be helping me. So, have you seen my duckling? Oh no, Nancy, what's happening? Can uh -oh, you see what's happening? He's getting away. He's, he's wandering out of the away. nest. <laughs> he's getting away. Early one morning. Uh oh, Liz, do you see him? Yeah, there he is. Oh, and oh, what are all these little duckies saying to their mommy? That he ran away. He ran away. Where <laughs> is he? And mommy ducky, oh no, can you see him? All the way over All there. All the way over there. Oh, here we go. <gasps> Where are they going now? They're gonna go look oh, for him. They're not gonna leave him behind, are they? Have you seen my duckling? Can you see him, Nancy? He's, He's hiding. hiding. Behind a lily. Behind <laughs> a lily. Okay, we're not going to go through the whole book, but my husband sort of looked at me, okay. <laughs> but that is what a child needs. It's simple. Have you seen my duckling? Is it engaging? Yes. And what have they enhanced? You need to look for the duck. And so it follows all of those very simple things. How many of you do this anyway with books that aren't even written like this? You know, so pat yourself on the back. You're doing what shared reading is all about. Um, another book that um, um, my daughter, and I'm not, I'm not going to name exactly the name of this series, but 
I just sort of stayed away from it, and she kept wanting me to read it and read it and read it. And finally, we had to do a guessing game. And so we actually stopped using the book after we've read it the millionth time or the billionth time. And we started guessing what, remember what was on this page, what was on this page. But actually, in the book, um, each character had something that they wanted to, they wanted. And so um, here's Big Bird, he wanted his teddy bear. And so what we've done is we've taken this and we've um, enhanced and to get, engage the children is we've taken the pictures from the books and actually after they've read the story, then they can match what each character wanted to do. Um, and Bert wanted his blanket. But as they're in the ages between um, three and six, we're what they call verbal learners. They learn by talking. Okay, they learn by talking. So at this particular age, between those ages, you need to find a lot of books where they're either being a part of the book or they're answering questions or they can read the book. Um, a very good book for this age is, Is Your Mama a Llama? Now why? Because it's very rhyming, it gets a lot of hints, but there's always a question that children or adults, you will help me out here, will answer. Is your mama a llama? Is your mama a llama? I asked my friend Dave. No, she is not, is the answer Dave gave. She hangs by her feet and she lives in a cave. I don't think that's how llamas behave. Oh, I said, you're right about that. I think your mama sounds more like a bat. Very good. Is your mama a llama? I asked my, fr my friend Fred. No, she is not, is what Freddie said. She has a long neck and white feathers and wings, and I don't think llamas has any of those things. Oh, I said, you needn't go on. I think your mother must be a swan. swan. Okay, <laughs> in these type of books, that's what you're going to want to look for for children between the ages of three, six, maybe even a little bit more, when they're being the verbal learners. Is it engaging? Yeah, they have to look. Is it enhancing? Is this book simple? Now, when we talk about simplification, that is the one thing that you might drop after your child gets a little bit older. But for books to be successful and that relationship, if you engage it in enhancement, it's the best way. For example, my daughter loves movies, and we showed, um, she watched a particular movie that she loved. Anyway, she actually um, would read any book about Teddy Roosevelt, any book, any book. And we did reports on Teddy Roosevelt. We studied about Teddy Roosevelt. Then we learned about all of his children <laughs> because she, we took that one movie and we enhanced it and it was very engaging. And she can tell you a lot about Teddy Roosevelt and some of her, his children too because she studied him so much. One thing that we know about books is books are not just for entertainment. They can be for information. An interesting study that I read one day um, really helped me get this next session, I mean next section, really made me think a little bit about it. When children start kindergarten, they ask every child in the class, how many of you want to read? How many of you like to read? And 100% said they either wanted to learn to read or they like to read. As they got into third grade, third and fourth grade, once again they said, how many of you like to read? Was it 100% do you think, Liz? I mean, Erica, sorry. No. <laughs> okay. Now, you're a, a former school teacher, right. right? And what grade did you teach? I taught second grade. Se second grade. At second grade, did you have children that didn't like to read at that point? Yeah. And about how many? I'm just going to put you on the spot here. I don't, probably 75% liked, and then the 25% that usually struggled reading were the ones that didn't like okay. to read. Okay. And so we are finding more and more children. They start out wanting to learn to read. They want to know how. And then they either struggle or something happens where they don't like it or they can't read. And there's a difference between the two. There's one that's called a resistant reader. That's where they have all the reading skills that they need, and, but they just don't like to read. Um, I hope not to put any of you on the spot, but is there any in this room that just didn't like to read when they were growing up? Anybody? Okay, Teresa, you had all the reading skills. You didn't have any reading disabilities, but you just didn't like to. 
we're finding with a lot of boys, and not I don't want to stereotype, but a lot of boys don't like the storybook stories. They want information. And so at this point, what we want to do is to start introducing, and even before this, find things your children like. If they like sports, get them a sports magazine. If they like recipes, if they like to cook, let them read recipe books. Those are a lot of hard words in them. It does not need to be a narrative story. Now, I've just got um, some examples of different books that you can get are what we call information books. It's book where, yeah, there might be some story. This one is an animal babies, and it's a counting book, but specifically it's about animals too. This one is a cloud book. This one is a book about earthquakes. These are what we call information books. And we're finding that the more children have this exposed to it, we, we, you know, we run away a lot from that resistant reader. Now, one thing that I really like about these books, um, these science emergent readers, is they ha they're very, very simple in the front. And then in the back, they have more information. And children really love this. I almost want to say they eat it up. They really like this information. Now, these are very, very good books for children that are what we call resistant readers finding out what they like, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be a boy, but we are finding that a lot of boys would rather read not a novel. In my home, I am reading all the time. In fact, it probably um, has caused some, con not contention, but you know, laundry hasn't gotten done, meals haven't been prepared, and I love to read about anything. Now, my husband has probably not read many novels in his life, but does he read history? Yes, he likes to read the nonfiction kind of books. Does it mean that I'm a better reader than him? No, it just means that we have particular different likes and dislikes. Finding out what your children like is a great way. Now, another thing in this stage is when children are starting to read on their own, there's some good hints of what's appropriate for my child and what isn't. I had a great um, teacher once tell me that for what we're looking for in this stage is comprehension and not just decoding and reading the book. And so a lot of times it's very good for you to read the first page and then let your child read the second page. Have the child put their hand over the page and just if they can read the picture, I mean the pictures, if they can read the words that are not covered by your hand, then usually it's an appropriate book. But if they're missing, you know, all of those words that are not covered, then you might want to get a simpler book for them to read, but you take it home and read to them. As we're talking about what's good for a child to read and what's good for you, Jim Trelease that writes the Read Out Loud handbook says that you should be reading two grade levels above where your children are reading. Okay, so if they're reading at a first grade level, you should be reading them books at a third grade level. Why do you think that is? What do you think that is, Liz? Why do you think you should be reading above what your child's reading level is? Any ideas? Probably because they're still hearing it. They're listening and they can think about it in their head even if they can't read it physically on the book. Okay, and I'm gonna go back to Erica, our, <laughs> our school teacher. Why is it good to be reading at a higher level? It, that was a great answer. Right, it exposes them to higher text. You don't want them reading at the exact same level. You want them to slowly progress. So if they're not exposed to the higher level thinking or reading, then they're just going to know the lower levels and they won't be able to progress, given okay. the things they know. So when they get there, it'll be... And easier. they can understand the words that they're mm -hmm. going to try to read. So remember that as you're picking books as a parent. Where is my child reading? What should I be reading to him? Another thing Jim Trelease um, said that we had to make some big changes in our home is most of the time, especially with my two older children, once they learn to read, we just sort of see you later, go to your room and read. But if we're reading two grade levels above, what does that mean? That they're reading and you're reading. Jim Trelease says we should stop reading to our children out loud when they leave our home. Isn't that an interesting concept? We stop reading to our children when they leave our home. Now, a lot of people, when I've said that to them, it almost is like, ooh, how could I read a book to my child? Well, can you watch a movie while your child's sitting there? 
you can gather as a family and read. I know we've tried this in our home and it's been very successful. In fact, just last Christmas we were driving up to Salt Lake and we've been reading a book and we had to take it and we had my parents with me and it was a very sad chapter and we were all crying <laughs> by the time we got to our destination, but we enjoy it. It's something that we look forward to. And you know, don't hesitate to start that now if you're young parents because then your kids will never know that it's not, you know, something that most people do. But gather your family around. Read two grade levels above where they are. Now, where does television come into this? Because we're talking about PBS shows. There's lots of shows that encourage reading and give you some steps to reading and different books. None of this is difficult. And, uh, and it should be lots of fun for both the child and the parent, Fox says. In fact, it should be so fun that the parent and child will want to continue the read out loud sessions long after the child has learned to read themselves. That's what I would encourage you to do. Remember to read two grade levels above where your children are, to simplify, enhance, and engage. Find books that they like and make sure that it's a bonding experience too.